Hello, this is Lawrence Romanowski from Calgary, Canada, and uh, what I have behind me here is a 1986 Jaguar XJSC Cabriolet. Um, now, with these walk around videos that I do, I try to, as best I can, replicate uh, like a showroom experience where you might come in, um, talk to somebody who hopefully has uh, half an idea of what they're talking about, um, and um, uh, go through the car, examine the exterior and the interior, you know, pick out all the faults. Uh, and what I can do in lug nuts is I can put it on the hoist and then we can go underneath the car, take the wheels off, go examine the brakes, suspension, etc. Um, go and do a thorough, uh, a thorough walk around underneath the car. Um, I can also do a paint meter report and it'll show this car to have original, uh, original paint. Um, and then we can do a startup video and a driving video. So all in all, this is, you know, an hour to two hours worth of footage um, on one particular car. It's not, it's meant for, you know, the person that wants to learn more about XJSs uh, and also the person who might want to be interested in buying this particular car. Um, so there's shorter videos, which are, you know, maybe more exciting. Um, but if you'll bear with me, um, I can do my best to give you a really comprehensive overview of uh, XJSs in general and this car. I have some other videos up uh, as well, driving videos, the history of the XJS, history of the V12 engine, which is actually really quite interesting. It's quite a special engine. Um, and so you can look to my YouTube channel, uh, Lawrence Romanowski. Uh, in Calgary and find uh, some of that content. Uh, but for this video, we're going to focus on this particular car uh, and um, uh, with the eye of, well, you know, now that it, it goes to the next custodian, you know, what kinds of things might you expect to do to it, you know, um, and, uh, you know, what's the overall uh, condition of the car, which is excellent. It's 67,000 kilometer original paint, original interior, unmodified, no accidents. Um, it's about as good a used car as you could possibly hope to find. Um, and, a, and a great example of this uh, Grand Touring Jaguar. So let's turn this camera around. We'll start with the exterior and then go underneath and then uh, talk about maintenance and then do a driving video. Okay, so this car was bought new in Calgary from Cook Motors. Cook Motors was the Jaguar and Porsche dealer uh, at the time. Um, the head mechanic for the Jags was a guy named Asit, who is my mechanic today uh, and who, has, who works on all of my British cars, including these two Jaguars. And he PDI'd this car, or PDR, PDI'd cars like this, when they were new and did all the factory training and has been working on the cars, well, since they were new. Okay, um, so it was bought at Cook Motors. We can see the um, faded license plate frame there and it was on Center Street. Uh, when it was very close to new, it sold to a property developer and kind of a, a, out of coincidence, the same property development company that actually built lug nuts and built this whole, uh, you know, this whole complex here in Barlow, in Barlow Square in Calgary. So that was a guy named Randy Remington, who's very well known in the city, okay? So it's kind of funny that this car was, was bought by him. Um, very shortly after it was new, I understand about a year, when it was about a year old or less, it sold to one of his uh, business associates uh, and that went into a family that uh, uh, I've been looking after their cars for the last uh, 20 years. Um, and so it, it's essentially a one owner car from, you know, 1987 to present. It has 67,000 kilometers on it. Uh, now the family that it went to, uh, they're, they're a wealthy Calgary family. Uh, there's probably, there's, you know, probably four of them share 12 cars, six months a year. So none of the cars that I've ever bought and sold, and I've probably bought and sold maybe 20 or maybe even 25 of their cars for them over, over, over the, over 20 years. None of them have high kilometers. 
Um, so some of them have hilariously low kilometers, in fact. So this one has 67,000 kilometers. Um, and uh, just looking through the service records on it and, and what I have for them, it looks like it got to about 50,000 kilometers in the first four years. And I've got the, you know, the maintenance stamp for its 50,000 50, kilometer service in uh, 1990. And then from 1990 to now, it was barely used at all. It's only, it's only uh, been driven about 17,000 kilometers uh, in, in those years. So this car lately, uh, and lately I, I mean in the last decade, has barely been used at all. Um, and uh, although it has had the benefit of some periodic servicing, uh, it's been stored outside the city in a country property and they did bring a mechanic in to do basic maintenance to the car, okay? So it's a car that really hasn't been driven that much in the last decade, uh, but that has received some servicing. When I got the car, uh, I gave it to a sit at XJ Automotive. We did an assessment of the car uh, and um, uh, we changed the oil, changed the fuel filters, had a look around. We tested the coolant, tested the brake fluid, and actually everything was okay. Uh, it was fairly recent, the car got a new battery. The uh, location where the car was stored was fully staffed and uh, they had people making sure the cars were operational. So um, it's not like it was just forgotten about. Uh... Okay, well that's the, the history of the car and uh, how uh, I went about uh, acquiring the car, how it found me. Uh, and now we can do a walk around video uh, and examine the paint, uh, bright work, uh, glass and trim. We can do a paint meter report on the car. I can show you all of those readings. Uh, we can then go into the interior and look at the upholstery and the canvas top and carpets, and floor pans, uh, etc. Um, and then we can uh, go underneath the car and have a look around, uh, take the wheels off, look at the brakes, which are inboard in the rear, the front and rear subframes, uh, look at the floor pans, uh, and look at the bottom of the car, uh, the sills and air dam and so forth. So that is fairly illustrative of uh, what the car has been through. And then we can take a look at the engine bay and we can go through a discussion on uh, Jaguar XJS servicing, and then we can go into the engine bay and have a discussion about Jaguar servicing and what kinds of things the uh, next owner or custodian uh, might expect uh, when, they, uh, when they start driving this car. Uh, we'll uh, cap it off with a cold start video and then a driving video, and by the end of it, uh, you should have a pretty good idea of the overall condition of this car and, uh, and hopefully uh, maybe learn a little bit more about the Jaguar XJS in the process. All right, so let's just start with the, uh, with the bonnet here. And the car has, uni I would say, uniform, very sort of slight uh, swirl marks in it. Um, you know, maybe the worst of it, uh, you can see on the front fender. Um, this will polish out. Um, I just took a, a light orbital uh, uh, with a with a like a swirl remover to it. I didn't I didn't try to do a deep uh, cut polish on the car. Just preferring to keep the original paint depth and not take away too much of it. Um, under these fluorescent lights, it shows everything. But uh, you know, if you wanted to bring that up a little bit, you could treat it to a cut polish, um, but the car looks very good. Um, as far as stone chips, there really isn't much at all uh, on this car. Um, you know, a couple of, uh, you can't even really see it, a couple of little chips here and there, um, but, uh, you know, not very many of them, especially considering it's 35 year old paint. Okay, so that is the bonnet. The front fender um, looks excellent. There's, you know, uniformly there's, there's slight imperfections in probably all the panels as you'd expect with 
an original paint car that's 35 years old, um, but nothing that would photograph or kind of warrant any um, any explanation. On the door, it's a little bit, we can see we've got one chip filled in there, another one there. Um, we've got a few marks in the driver's door. We can see uh, a chip at the top here that has been filled in. Filled in. Uh, the rear fender looks good. The trunk lid, again, some very faint swirl marks, but no chips or other imperfections. The back panel here also, I noticed that I filled in a chip there where somebody shut the uh, trunk uh, a little bit too hard and then uh, chipped the paint there. So it just needs a really light uh, close. Um, otherwise it can, it can uh, hit the bottom of the, of the uh, trunk cylinder. Okay, so the passenger rear fender, and there's nothing really on that. Uh, looks like there's a little mark on the top there. And nothing on the passenger door. Or the passenger front fender. Okay, so, you know, a couple chips that are filled in. Uh, minor, uh, mostly from the, mostly on the driver's door from opening it into something. And you, you know, the, the car could probably use a cut polish. Um, in terms of door dings, it looks very clean on the driver's side. Driver's door. And very clean on the past, there's a couple of minor indents here. Let's see a little one. But that's a bit Okay. Uh, let's go to glass. It is pretty good. I don't really see anything in the way. A couple of very minor, no, hardly anything at all. One minor chip that I can see on the windshield. Yeah. A couple minor pits on the windshield, no cracks or anything else. Uh, the seal is still reasonably supple. Um, and the uh, bright work has some light, uniform scratching, um, but looks pretty good. All the trim is there. Okay. The side window, you wouldn't expect anything there. The rear window, these don't open. And the rear plastic window is in nice shape. There's no, sometimes they, um, where they fold, they'll crease and break. So. There's no brakes in this one, and it uh, shows a little bit of swirling, but uh, again, that can be polished out, okay? Um, and let's just walk around the car and the side glass. Well, there's a little bit of a scratch. It's really hard to see, but on the inside of this window, There's a little bit of a scratch there. Okay. Um, for the light lenses and the rubbers, all of that looks in nice shape. No discoloration. The um, seals are still reasonably supple. The uh, uh, headlights aren't uh, cracked. Um, the surround, you can see it's just starting to lift there. The other extra S is actually peeling off, so you can see it just starting to lift on this this uh, kind of metal coated plastic. Uh, wipers are in nice shape. The bumper's in nice shape. The grill is in nice shape. There's no cracking on this lens. The bumper 
Uh, all that foam is in nice shape. And on the screen there. Okay, so these lights are all nice. Bumpers are nice. Let's look at the rear lights. And there's no cracks. And the seal is still supple. Badging is intact. And there's no corrosion. Sometimes, you know, you see cars where there's muck under there and a lot of corrosion and rusty bolts and so on. This one's, this one's pristine. Also, you know, all these fasteners on the, on the inside of the trunk, um, you know, they're all pristine. And that tells you the car is a fair weather car. All right. Uh, rear tail light lens, it's good. Okay, so the bumpers, Chrome is in nice shape, the rubber is in nice shape, and there's no evidence that this has hit anything. Um, and it's straight with no scuffs. Let's check the front, and the same there. There's no evidence of any bumper scuffs. Okay, down below, the sills are all in nice shape. Um, I did refinish them, um, and I can show you pictures of what they looked like before. There was just a little bit of um, gravel rash behind the wheels, as might be expected. Um, and I just blew in a little bit of paint to clean that up a little bit, just so it's perfect. There's the drain hole for the trunk right there. Okay. All right, um, chrome trim. So fuel filter, fuel filler. The door handles are all nice. The gaskets are all nice. There's no, you know, with the original paint car, there's no uh, masking marks there. Mirrors are nice. Wipers are in nice shape. This girl's in nice shape. Badges. It has the correct gasket beneath it. If we go under the car, you can see that grill. So sometimes that gets rusty. And this one is pretty good. Okay, you don't need. All right, front spoiler uh, also looks good. It's not uh, chewed up. Okay. Uh, the fog lights, I mean, actually I haven't even ever taken these off. Okay, let's have a look at the doors. Which close really nice. And if we look at the striker and uh, we see just a tiny little bit of where uh, uh, from the closing mechanism, okay? And the we see the sill, actually the brown one's like this too. Um, this gets ripped up when people uh, get in and out. Okay, so other than that, everything looks good. And there's no evidence that, you know, this has been changed or moved. Um, the bottoms of the door panels can have a little bit of a rough time because they get kicked. And then we see a tiny little bit of wear on the bottom edge of this panel. Uh, the armrest looks good and the uh, wood looks good. For the trunk closure, um, it closes really nicely. You don't need a lot of effort on these. Um, it opens and closes really nice. Okay, and passenger door as well. And that's indicative of a car that's never been hit and where you've got the factory shut lines. Looking inside this door, again, we don't see any evidence that the striker plate has been moved. The sills look good. And we've got kind of a characteristic rip in that bottom sill when people get in and out. And we've got a tiny little bit of wear on the sill there. For this door panel, um, you know, obviously people have got in this less than the other side, 
And these are leather pieces here. And all this looks nice and the wood looks nice. I'm not sure what that is. It looks to be original. Actually, I've got, oh, you know what that is? That must be where they, they screw it in and then fill it. Okay, on both sides. Okay, so the door panels look good. Let's look at the carpet and some marks on the rubber here, but the carpet looks excellent. Um, there's no salt staining. Of course, it wasn't driven in the winter. Um, and uh, this isn't chewed up. If we pull back the carpets, we see the original underlay and then the floor pans, uh, which are pristine. And this material hasn't broken up at all, okay? So all that looks good. For the center console, also in leather, all that is good. And this doesn't appear to be marked up uh, at all for the leather. The driver's seat is, um, it's got the original patina, which is very nice. I used the leather -eek, um conditioner on it, which has brought it back nicely. And it's uh, wonderful, just the right amount of patina soft and aer aer aromatic, um, as only the Connolly leather uh, can be. I shouldn't say only, but characteristic of the Connolly leather. And uh, the bolster, you know, there's some slight wear there, uh, but the seat looks good and the cushion's still firm. You know, the, the foam in the cushion hasn't collapsed. And it might actually be even horsehair in these cars, I don't know, okay. Um, back here, of course, nothing's ever been back there. And so we've got the, I'm not sure if that's an Alcantara or a wool. I think it's actually, it could be a wool headliner. And it is in nice shape. And it's, there's a Velcro fastening there. So all that area looks good. And we've got the umbrella. And what else do we have? And all that carpeting looks good. Okay, so everything back here, as you'd expect, uh, looks nice. The dash is uh, doesn't have any cracks in it. It looks good. The wood in the dash looks good. There's a little crack in the glove box. I don't know if you can see that. And uh, the same was an exact same thing as in the brown one that I had too. Okay. Uh, this is all original. Original trip computer and original head unit and the original Jaguar keys uh, and key fob, okay. Uh, the steering wheel is in nice shape. Sometimes they're cut up by rings and so on. And so it looks good, okay. Let's go to the passenger seat. And again, it just has the natural patina, no real wear to speak of. And uh, in the leather interior in this car is in beautiful shape. So very, very hard to fault. Um, well, inside or out really. Carpets is in nice shape. And let's just lift up this. Doesn't really want to get lifted up, but you can see the virgin floor pans underneath that. Door card's in good shape. Um, this rubber seal for the roof panels is still supple and the canvas is all still in really nice shape. The one, the one fault, I guess, cosmetically is that, I'm not sure what this line is here. Almost looks like some glue or something is coming through. Not sure about that, um, but uh, this piece of canvas in the front is slightly discolored at the leading edge. Okay, uh, into the trunk. Uh, everything looks good in the trunk. Here is the bag for the uh, soft tops, or sorry, the, the hard top panels, and they are all in perfect shape. Uh, this car has a cover for the spare wheel, which I just took off a moment ago. I just put back on. There's the battery cover, and this car does have the uh, original tools, which are all in good shape, okay? Carpet bottom 
is in nice shape. I think there was a flaw. Is there a flaw? Wow. Oh, really? See, it's a little bit of a divot taken out of the, the carpet over there, but it's hardly worth mentioning. And that side's good too. Okay. The tonneau is in nice shape, although I did find it a little bit challenging to fit. Uh, and I gave up after breaking a couple nails. <laughs> Didn't have any more nails left, so I gave up on that. I think you probably need to stretch it a little bit, wet it and stretch it to make it fit a little bit easier. It's pretty tight. Okay. Let's have a look at the wheels and tires. And we've got uh, some stickers left over from previous uh, wheel weights. Um, we have old tires. Um, uh, I think these, if I read the date codes correctly, I think these are from 1996. So these tires are, uh, are uh, uh, 25 years old, um, but they're almost brand new. <laughs> I've never been driven. Anyway, this gives you an idea of the storage conditions of the car if those tires have been on it for 25 years and they still look brand new, okay? Um, but they, and, and they work fine and, they, and the, the car has, uh, you know, drives beautifully. So you'd never know, uh, but they should be replaced. Um, uh, but I'll leave that to the next owner. There's a... Uh, three tires that I found in this size and speed rating. There is the uh, Vredestein Sprint Classic. There is a remanufactured Pirelli P5, which the car would have had originally, and which is the original spare. And then there's the Michelin XWX, which is kind of an exotic choice. That would have been the uh, OEM equipment for Ferrari boxers and uh, exotic cars. So the um, all of it good. I think the, the P5s are about, or the, the Vredesteins, uh, which I put on this brown car there, are around 250 US. Um, uh, and the Michelins, I think, are close to 400 US. If you wanted the OEM tire, what you'd be getting is a P5. And these were made specially for Jaguar. And so that's the uh, original spare and wheel. The Bredestines, Bredestein, Bredestein, um, they are speed rated, the correct size, and uh, they look very similar to the uh, P5. So that's what I did on that car. And, and I got those through the tire rack and it was about, I think, I think they were 250 a tire. But with shipping and getting them to Canada is very expensive. So I got about an $1,800 bill, $1, bill on that. And the XWXs, they were, I think that's close to $3,000 if you want the XWXs. So probably the, the, and the P5s are in the middle. So those are your choices for tires, but it, it's fine the way it is. Um, but of course, most people would not recommend you drive on at least, at least far and fast on 25 um, year old tires. Okay, so let's look at this rim and it's in nice shape. Uh, they are, and again, there's a little bit of residue from stickers, tiny little mark up there, but, uh, it looks good. Um, and on this side, uh, again, some very slight wear or uniform wear, but the rim looks, uh, looks good and none of them are bent or anything. Um, and I'm looking for the DOT sticker, which is that, which I think dates these tires, I could be wrong on that, from to 1996. That 136 number at the end, I think this, the last digit is the, is the year. Uh, okay, and then let's look at the front rim. All right. That I think shows you all the exterior pieces of the car. And we can now take our handy paint meter uh, and run it around all the panels. So I'll videotape that. Uh, this is, uh, you can do it in mils or um, uh, micrometers. A micrometer is one thousandth 
of a millimeter. So a uh, factory paint depth is around um, 200 plus or minus, and usually they can vary by, you know, 50 each way, depending on the way the paint sits uh, when it's sprayed. And then if the car was polished or something, sometimes it can be thinner. So let's take a look and we'll do a paint meter report on the car. And we're expecting, you know, in the ones and twos for original paint. You get the odd reading. Um, and again, we're talking about, uh, you know, two hundredths of a millimeter here. So 0.2 of a millimeter. 0.3 of a millimeter. If it was repainted, you're generally getting threes and fours and fives and sixes. And you can get misreads as well, the odd ones. Driver's door. Rear fender. Now this car has, it had like a, an undercoating um, put on it on the lower sills when it was brand new and that laid over top of the factory paint. So if I do this, um, it's not very thick. Okay, I was expecting thicker, but, uh, and here's the area where I retouched. It still doesn't, I, I just blew in a light coat just to freshen that underneath of it. So it looks like what I did is I probably replaced the paint that was gone, because it's still factory. Trunk lid. Passenger rear fender.
you don't hold it square to the surface, sometimes you can get a misread. Uh, and on a curved panel, it can be hard. Passenger door. And what you're looking for is you're looking for like a big jump, you know, for it to go from, you know, 200 to 1,000 or something like that. Um, you're not looking for differences in, uh, you know, uh, you know, 0.1 of a millimeter because, you know, the, there's still a fair amount of handwork involved uh, refinishing these cars when they were painted. It can account for slight differences. So you're just looking for a big jump. Lastly, the passenger front fender. Okay, and that just happens to be the same readings as this car here, which is also um, an original paint car, okay? So, uh, this car then has original paint throughout with no uh, evidence of any paintwork or any damage. So what we're going to do is uh, have a look underneath the car and uh, examine the bodywork and the general condition of the undercarriage. And that is a whole lot easier to do when you've got the thing um, six feet in the air. So uh, we'll turn this camera around, we'll have a look underneath this Jag and uh, go through some of the interesting um, design, design details uh, as well as uh, take a close look at the condition. All right, so the most vulnerable parts of the car uh, to rust and damage and so on are like the lower six inches. So if you were gonna see um, corrosion, uh, you'd see it in the wheel arches and in the sills and so on, particularly behind the wheels. Um, and you can see that uh, the uh, inner wheel arch, this is the passenger um, uh, front, and that's all in really nice shape. Now, you can see a difference in the paint. Now, this is Cranberry CEE between the sill and the top. Now that's not factory, That I think the dealer would have put that on. I've got another, um, well, I'll just show you that. I've got another XJSC, same year, Canadian car, only a few months apart in production, and uh, the, um, uh, the paint's the same. So I think what happened in this case is, you know, this was just the undercoating that the dealer offered. And actually it did a pretty good job um, because, uh, you know, you can see, you know, these areas here, right where the, the jacking point is. Uh, well, if you jack it up there, you know, crack the paint and, and uh, moisture can get in there and it can rust that piece. But in this case, it was, uh, I noticed on a couple of occasions, it was just the outer paint that had cracked and the inner paint was unbroken. Now I touched these areas up a little bit, um, uh, uh, which I can show you photographs of what they look like before and after. Um, just to seal the paint. So there's a little bit of road rash, you know, as there always is, you know, right behind the wheels. Okay, but uh, looking at that, it is all pretty nice. The sills are all pretty nice. This overspray is from, it's not, this car has original paint and that's not from a collision, but that's, that's the this textured kind of undercoating that was oversprayed when it was new, okay? So um, the body shell on this car is perfect, basically. Okay, and we can see that as well. And in behind here, and you know, there's nothing even in behind there. You know, oftentimes this is just caked up gunk and that's why it rusts, right? But it's very clean, okay. Uh, in behind the back here, uh, all looks good. 
And this is factory. This is the undercoating from the factory. And this is what the dealer put on. But that line is, uh, this is the way that the other one is too. And you can see that this is chipping away a little bit. Um, on the brown one, it's a little bit worse, but on this one, it's starting. So this undercoating starts to uh, dry out. And then, um, you know, you can see in places where it is uh, chipping off. Um, in the worst cases, water gets in behind that and starts to rust. It doesn't look like the case with this car, but uh, you know, you could probably, I mean, this car probably deserves a nice cryoblast and uh, to, you know, just clean that up a little bit. Um, and uh, you know, if you did that, you could, you know, touch up some of those areas or re-undercoat it, okay? But anyway, um, all looks very nice in there. And again, these areas I touched up a little bit, uh, but I'll show you what that looked like before, okay? Sills look good. Well, here's an example of that cracking paint. But if I get under there, actually there's the original paint that's still there. Okay, so that undercoating did its, did its job. That sill looks good. I don't know what that is. I just have to clean that off. Anyway, that's underneath the car. Uh, okay, and then we get to the front wheel arch, which all looks nice. All right, and underneath here, and you can see that all the fasteners are still uncorroded. And obviously this car um, has had an easy life. All right, so uh, that is the lower part of the bodywork. Uh, another another part of the video will paint meter the car and shows it all to have original paint. So we'll get that done, satisfy anybody's concern. The doors and the trunk lid and the bonnet all shut nicely. So it's just a really great original body shell. And that is the most important thing. Um, yes, yes XGSs need lots of maintenance, but with any classic car, uh, the body shell uh, is by far the most important piece and the most expensive to fix and the hardest to find people to, to fix it. Talented metal, uh, uh, metal guys, metal shapers and so on who can do competent rust repair is very rare, very difficult to find. And when you find them, they're like booked up like forever. Okay, so underneath the car, um, we have this splash guard there. That's part of the ducting for the radiator. We see the two horns there. Now on an XJS, the um, Front and rear suspension are held on by subframes, which then um, uh, are unbolted. And so we can see this kind of black strip there is the carrier for all this suspension. To, so to get at the engine, you actually have to take the subframe off, which is not big a deal. It all comes off. I don't know if it's a three or four hour job or whatever it is to get it off. And then you can get at the engine and, uh, you know, address that. So we see the, um, uh, I believe those are power steering hoses. Uh, and uh, there's the steering rack over there, the catalytic converters and the transmission. And it all looks pretty decent. There is, you can see a little drip of oil, so it does drip a little bit. I don't think enough to warrant all the work uh, to take this all apart right now. I think I wanna drive it a little bit and see what else might be leaking before I disassemble that. Uh, so I'll put up with a little bit of a drip, um, uh, at least for a while. I, I just got the car, so I wanted to put about, you know, a thousand kilometers on it or something like that, just to, uh, you know, you know, for any, any problems to materialize before I dug into it and gave it its major service. So I did the oil change and I did, uh, we just checked all the fuel and the fuel filters and stuff like that and made sure it was okay. Um, and it is. Uh, but I didn't do any more than that. So you can see there's a little bit of an oil leak and I believe that's coming from the cam cover. Uh, I did have it inspected and that is what my mechanic said, okay? Uh, the floor pans, you know, undamaged and they look excellent. And as the, you know, the, all the fasteners are unrusty and throughout the car. Exhaust looks a little bit secondhand, but there's no soft metal and there's no holes in it. Okay, and so here is the 
rear subframe, and then with the Jag, this is this design came from, well, the E-Type, I think actually the sedans before that, and you can see the subframe isolated on these big rubber mounts. And that's part of what makes the XJS so refined and smooth and silent is that uh, both the uh, suspensions um, isolated from the body. So, so we see the two uh, coilovers in the rear uh, and uh, the inboard disc brake. So if you need to replace the pads on these, well, that's a, that's a little bit hard because uh, the whole subframe has to come down and the exhaust has to come off and so on. But there's no real, you know, they're probably 80% left on the rotors. So, that, and, and most of the time you use the, most of the wear goes to the front rotors, not the rear because of the weight transfer. So I don't think you're gonna have to get in there and do anything about uh, brake pads anytime soon. Um, and uh, there's the other side. So, you know, when the time comes to do that, you know, then you might decide you're gonna, you know, clean up the subframe a little bit or maybe repaint it or, you know, be blasted. It's pretty good. Just a tiny little bit of surface rust on the back. And again, it's it's coated with, uh, you know, that's, that's undercoating that, that chips off, okay? So, and behind the rear bumper, there's no damage. Again, all the fasteners look good. Um, exhaust tips look nice. Uh, there's no uh, holes in the trunk. Uh, we can see more of this uh, undercoating. But when I do that, I don't get rust. I just get the painted metal, okay? So that's all kind of vulnerable to come off. So I, I, you know, you might go in there and touch that up, okay. Uh, the subframe looks good. The shocks aren't leaking. I uh, got a little bit of dirt and build up on that. Uh, that would clean up really nicely with a cryoblast if you ever wanted to do that. It depends. It's the underneath of the car, so it may or may not be important too. Uh, but it all, all looks pretty good. Okay, so now let's go through the servicing of uh, this Jag, of, of XJSs in general, of this car in particular, of the service history, and probably most importantly for the next owner, what kinds of things can they expect when they own and drive the car and how much is it gonna cost? So that's, I think, what everybody wants to know when buying an old car and particularly an old Jaguar. Um, this is the original um, service uh, manual with the car. Uh, it's got a sticker there which gives the key codes, so if you need an extra key, you can just give those codes to a locksmith and they can make you a new key. And it goes into service on May 3rd, 1986. Now this doesn't really make a lot of sense. It went into, it, it went into service in May of 86. So according to this, it comes in for its 1,600 kilometer service with 13,000 kilometers. I don't think that that's right. Um, I have another service here, which is supposed to be the 25,000 kilometer service, and it's coming in August of 87, uh, which is, um, you know, less than a year, or just a bit more than a year after it went into service with only 2,500 kilometers. Okay, 
So make of that what you will. Uh, there's probably a mistake in there somewhere. And maybe th these two are just reversed. Maybe it came in in November of 86 with 2,500 kilometers and then August of 87 with 13,000. That seems a little bit more reasonable to me. Um, and then we've got uh, this stamp here with 49,000 kilometers in, in the fall of 1990. So um, that would make sense for a car that's daily driven in the summer. So then you've got five summers, 10,000 kilometers a summer, and um, that's where the maintenance stops in the book. Uh, it gets picked up a little bit in the door jam, um, and I see May 9th of an indeterminate year with 63,700 kilometers, and behind here, it's just too hard to make out. It looks like it's sometime in the 1990s, um, and I just can't make it out. So there's, you can see that it's got a, you know, whole stack of uh, what were oil change uh, stickers in the door jam. So this car was, um, like I said earlier, it was bought new by a property developer. It looks like it was used as a daily driver in the summer for the first five years and it got to 50,000 kilometers in 1990. And in the last 30 years, it's only been driven another 17,000 kilometers. So it was basically um, uh, just sort of put away. Um, the family that it's from, you know, like I said, uh, you know, they have, you know, 10 or 12 cars and multiple properties in Canada and, and they only spend half the year in Canada. So none of these cars were driven very much. In, none of their cars were driven very much. Um, now the car, that isn't to say that it was just forgotten about because this car lived beside the Volvo P1800 that I sold on BAT recently uh, and several other cars and it was in a country property and they brought in a mechanic to do periodic servicing. Um, from talking to their property manager, I understand that this car got some fuel system work new hoses, although I don't have records for that, I can't tell you exactly what uh, what uh, what was done to it, but a lot of these hoses look like they are new. I can't tell you exactly. Uh, when we went through the car uh, with my mechanic, uh, a sit who runs XJ Automotive, um, we didn't see anything alarming in terms of uh, uh, hoses or wires or anything that had been neglected, there was nothing cracking, etc. So it has got some periodic regular maintenance over the years, but I don't have records for it. When I got the car, which was a few months ago, it went to a sit, we did a, um, an assessment of the car. We gave it a basic oil service. We checked the uh, fuel tank and the fuel in it. Uh, we replaced the fuel filter uh, and so on. And, uh, but that's all we did on this car. So, um, what that means is that, I mean, the car runs and drives fine. Drivability is excellent. Um, everything works. Uh, it is a small oil drip that is somewhat intermittent, but it is there. Um, that was diagnosed, and you can talk to it to a sit about it. Um, that was diagnosed as a leak from the cam carrier, uh, which isn't especially easy to get to on this car. And if we look straight down here, um, well, first of all, we can see the long black uh, valve cover, which runs the length of the engine. And then that piece uh, at the end is called a half moon, okay? And you can see it's beneath the intake manifold. And if we put the light and we look in the center of the V of the engine, we can see that it's not bad, actually, um, but there is some evidence, and it's not wet, it's just that there is some evidence of some seepage uh, in that area. Um, that is one thing that is on the horizon, although you wouldn't necessarily have to address that right now, but um,
but it's not going to get any better. So it's actually pretty good back there, but you know, you can see, and, and especially for the car that is this age and with this complexity, it could be a whole lot worse, but it's not quite bad enough for me to tear into it um, because I don't want to go through this much work and then just do one thing. I'd rather put some miles on the car and drive it and then see what else comes up and then do everything at once. This is not a car that you want to do things piecemeal. Um, you want to do a thorough assessment. You want to look at your driving needs and use and then do everything at once. So I'm trying to give you an idea of what's kind of in the crevices here of this engine. It's hard to light up. Um, you can see it's a little bit wet down there, okay? A little bit of an oil film, okay? But, it, you know, it's, these are, this isn't a big leak, and frankly, any engine of this age uh, is going to uh, leak a little bit. The problem with the Jag is that it's not that easy to get at anything. And I can probably give you a short explanation of why that is. Um, for a V12 engine, uh, it's necessary to have a, a 60 degree V just so you can balance out the, um, the firing impulses for the four stroke engine and achieve the perfect smoothness. Okay, so just about all V12 engines are a 60 degree V. And that's pretty narrow, and that does not allow you a lot of space in between the V for your intakes. If you look at something like a Ferrari V12, you know, it's got all the big Webers that are stacked there and then a big hood scoop. But if you want a low bonnet line and you want a V12, well, then you can't really put the intake in the center of the V. If you put the intake in the center of the V, then you could expose the uh, valve covers and make your life a lot easier when they start to leak and they start to leak on just about every car. But to get that low bonnet line, you see you've got these curved intake runners and then the intake manifolds, which run on the side of the engine, which is the only place for them because they can't be on top. And because they're there, well, then now you're covering up the valve covers. And if you want to get in there, you have to take all these pieces off. So when I talk to a sit about it, just to uh, put that into terms of hours and money, uh, he said that to, to take the intake manifolds off and to get in there and to do the valve cover gaskets and the cam carrier gaskets, which are beneath the valve covers, is about 12 hours of labor. Uh, so in Canada, it's about $150 an hour. And so that's $1,800. The, there's, there's no parts at all. It's just a gasket material. Um, so that's what's required to attend to that job alone. Now, the thing is, when you do that and you've got the intakes off, well, then, you know, the distributor is accessible. There's an O-ring in the distributor, which you should probably change. Uh, you know, that would be a good time to replace the spark plugs and the spark plug wires. Um, you can assess these uh, fuel hoses, and I think that they've already been done, um, but you can assess all of those and see if you want to replace them. And then you, you know, once all that's off, I mean, it's a pretty good time to go through it, maybe clean up some of the wiring connections, the grounds, uh, and to replace whatever hoses you uh, might find that have perished, uh, look at all, any electrical connections as, as well. And, and do that with a long-term view of um, having a reliable car, okay? So, um, like I said, it doesn't have to be done right away, but it is there, and it's no surprise that a car of this age has some slight seepage from the valve covers. Uh, it's just that because it's a Jaguar V12 and because, you know, you've got this beautifully smooth 12-cylinder engine, uh, which is, you know, part of the charm of the car. Uh, it's designed to have a low bonnet line that dictates where kind of all the major pieces in the engine are, and that dictates uh, the servicing uh, complexity, which isn't there on some other cars, but then other cars don't have a silky smooth V12 engine. So this is part and parcel of the, of the 
of, of the ownership experience. And when you get to the, you know, when you get a V12 um, in a passenger car, that's kind of kind of what you have to put up with. Okay, so I think I've made that point. Um, the Jags do require more maintenance. Uh, you have to go into uh, the, the ownership uh, of an XJS with your eyes open. Um, the things that happen to the car, perished hoses, gaskets, and so forth, aren't any different than any other car. Uh, it's just that the layout and the complexity uh, requires more, uh, you know, more time and arguably somebody with a little bit more experience to work on the car. Um, having that said, uh, the uh, extra maintenance is part and parcel of the design of the car, which offers um, many uh, very tangible benefits, uh, which include the almost complete isolation from noise, vibration, harshness, from suspension noise, road noise, uh, uh, jolts from the suspension, a beautifully smooth and torquey V12 engine that is inherently perfectly balanced in its 60 degree formation and produces excellent torque from idle right up to 6,500 RPM and is a real joy. So uh, it's true that you will spend more money on a Jag uh, to keep it up and it's a car that, that doesn't suffer deferred maintenance very well and that needs uh, you know some expertise to look after it properly. But there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the car. Um, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the increased uh, labor that, that goes into, you know, replacing gaskets and so on is necessary because uh, of, the, uh, of the overall design, which is a 60 degree V12 in a, in a low bonnet line car. And, uh, and the, uh, the subframes that uh, carry the suspension pieces uh, are a little bit, you know, make things a little bit harder to get at. Uh, but there's but there's advantages to those two which are real and part of the joy of owning uh, a vintage Jaguar. So I, so I wouldn't shy away from a Jaguar thinking that it's some mysterious English patient that's going to give you a lot of inconvenient surprises and random problems. Um, I, I don't think that's true at all. Uh, I think that it, it's a car that you just need to look after and it needs, you know, some expert care or a knowledgeable owner uh, and uh, somebody who's going to understand, you know, the basic design of the car and then take the increased hours that it takes to do some procedures in stride uh, viewed as, uh, you know, a, a good trade-off uh, given the car's um, uh, refinement and performance. Okay.